Hello everybody, Carlton Pearson, your friend and fellow sojourner in expanded consciousness, radically inclusive love. Welcome to tonight's telecast or infocast or whatever this is. <laughs> the internet is, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. The, the internet is an incredible phenomenon that we're still grappling with um, its impact and import. It's very important and that we're able to speak live to people all over the planet simultaneously. And we open most times with a song by my friend Charles Holt about tapping. Tapping does stimulate energy, blood flow in your face, physically, in your body. But also when you tap on my mind, which the whole program is streaming consciousness or expanded consciousness, thinking outside the box thinking a little bit um, newer and in fact we're going to talk about apostasy and um, heresy and things that are sort of coin phrases and within the Christian world and they identify certain people as deviants but the most creative things that have happened on the planet have come through people who were originally called heretics whether that's in the world of science, music, mathematics, ministry, theology talking about theology and I spent a lot of time talking about theology which means God thought or God logic theologos the logic of of theos or theo what you think about God because that is such a prevailing and influential uh, mentality on the planet I mean people what people think about God uh, determines how they think about themselves and how they, their worldview. If you see this angry, visceral, vin, vindictive, um, sneaky, snoopy, paranoid, suspicious God, and you're really committed to that God, then you're going to become paranoid and suspicious and creepy and judgmental and vindictive and jealous, vengeance is mine, that whole mentality. And I've been now at um, 45 years licensed in the ministry, 43, ordained, uh, about this God. I've studied the scriptures and read everything supplementary to it that I could find. And I've um, preached and prayed and done all kinds of things around this whole concept of God and, uh, and how I think about God, how God relates to me, how I relate to God. But what God? Now, I, I have a lot of atheist friends, and they say they don't believe in God, and I say to them, which one? Because there's so many out there. There's so many images of God, so many, and some of them are very frightening. And those images of God, whether they're especially within the Abrahamic faiths, whether they have influenced Jews, Christians, or Muslims, or Islamic people, and that's about two, four billion people of the seven billion people on the planet are either Christian or Islamic. A few hundred million are Jews. But all of them are called the Abrahamic faiths. We have a huge impact on the planet. So here we are at the, in the 21st century, and I'm just rethinking this since I've been studying it all my life as a fourth generation fundamentalist Pentecostal preacher. I mean, my parents on both sides, uh, my grandparents on both sides, and great grands on both sides. In fact, you know, for the last four or 500 years in America, particularly in the African American commu uh, community, we were converted to Christianity after we came from Africa. So it's, there's a, a prevalence and preponderance within the culture to believe in some superstitions and some myths and uh, some fairy tales about God and good and evil and demons and spirits and angels and dreams and haunts and hates and, you know, um, all these, these abstract, invisible, ubiquitous entities or ideologies that influence our thinking and of whom we are afraid and uh, we're appeasing an angry God or pleasing a difficult one. Can we talk? I'm going to talk about apostasy, the real apocalypse. The word apostasy means falling away. You won't actually see that term in the scriptures and in some of the um, more modern translations, but the Greek word term for falling away is apostasy or apostate. Uh, <clears throat> And then there's apocalypse, and when you, you, when you see movies or hear references to apocalypse, they, they usually show disaster and some terrible biblical storm or some, strata, some, some extravagant, uh, violent, natural disaster, 
you know, the stars falling out of the sky, which is impossible because the stars are bigger than the earth to destroy it. But these whole concepts of the little teeny stars falling out and God throwing darts and earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes and mudslides and tsunamis and this horrible image of the end of the world. The word actually means revelation, revelum, pulling back the veil, apocalypsis in Greek, apau. Apol, which is off, calypso, the taking off the top or the cover. Apocalyptic, a pulling back or pulling away or lifting the veil. Revelum, revelation, the veil, pulling away. That's the Latin for pulling away the veil. Joel Goldstein, a brilliant, one of the most brilliant thinkers in expanded consciousness, wrote: Revelation always comes as somewhat of a shock. Not only to the person who receives the revelation, but also to those with whom it is shared. It is the nature of revelation to be shocking and startling because when it hits up against our cherished beliefs, we become conscious of the degree to which our minds have been conditioned by the opinions and theories current in human thinking and suddenly realize the extent of our enlightenment. When you study the scriptures as long as I have and preach the scriptures and taught the scriptures and believe the scriptures as long as I have, to come to the kind of revelation that I consider myself to have come to, um, it's pretty stunning, it's pretty shocking, it's un- it's unnerving, it's bothersome, it's worrisome, because I'm. it's like I've been asleep so long, and then suddenly this bright light of illumination, a revelation comes to being, and the cover is pulled, and it's initially offensive, it's startling. But as your eyes or vision acclimates to the light, you can see more clearly. People have walked in darkness so long until light is very disturbing. And that's what I'm experiencing when I meet people who hold on to the darkness. I, um, I, I, I opened my, I sent a, I put a, um, a um, um, posted something today uh, on, 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 uh, online, I quoted Matthew Henry who said, None so deaf as those who will not hear, none so blind as those who will not see. None so deaf. There are none so deaf as those who will not hear. None so blind as those who will not see. And none so sick as those who just refuse to heal. I added that part. And and that's gotten quite a bit of a response because people took some of the things I said about apostasy and revelation and new thought or expanded consciousness uh, in a way that was a bit disturbing. So Thessalonians is where we get this whole idea of the apostasy or the great falling away. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, that is the letter written to the church at Thessalonica. Paul wrote the letter. It's one of the earliest and most extant letters that we have of his that we believe are originals. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Now, 1 Thessalonians, he talks about the second coming of the Lord, Jesus. The Christians are going through a terrible, horrific persecution. They're being fed to wild animals in Rome, and um, they're, being, they've, they're having the skin ripped off their flesh while they're alive, sharp objects stuck up their fingernails, beards pulled out, sawed in two, burned at the stake, horrendous, unsensible things, crazy things are happening, And the only way that Paul, who was himself in a panic, running from city to city, getting kicked out of every city and or many cities and stoned and beaten and and you see miracles of somebody getting healed and maybe raised from the dead, that's not clear. But there were times when one or two times it looked like in New Testament that miracles happened. They're not real specific in scripture as to what those miracles were, but we assumed, as Paul says, there was a manifestation of power. God showed up with power. Uh, But then that same God who did a miracle will allow Paul to be stoned or one of the disciples or apostles apostles to be sawed in two, or burned at the stake, or or fed to wild animals. This was a crazy time. Now remember, Christianity was barely 30 years old, the whole religion itself. And yet this horrible persecution was coming, so all they could do was was preach the second coming quickly. That was a form of escapism. They wanted out of here. Now, they didn't know that it would be at least 2,000 years before the quote-unquote second coming would occur. It hasn't occurred yet. But people read these scriptures, they're called into the world freaks. Uh, but we read this stuff and we, we come up with these and concoct these manufactured fabrications of truth to try to justify or at least add some kind of explanation to the craziness of the world we live in. I think sometimes 
the victim consciousness of Christianity, and it's built around victim consciousness. Jesus was the sacrifice lamb. The word sacrifice comes from the concept of victimization. Whatever lamb or animal was the sacrifice was the victim of the of the of um, the flock. Jesus is the perfect lamb, you know, that comes from a Jew- Jewish messianic thought of a perfect lamb and the slaying of goats and lambs and rams or whatever uh, to appease an angry God or please a difficult one. That's nothing new with Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. Uh, it goes with all the religions who are always trying to appease an angry God. The concept of God is angry. I call it fear-based theologies. Your God logic is based on fear, like demons. They're afraid of demons, they're afraid of entities, fear of the gods, phobias. That's prevailing. And so we're all trying to please this angry God. And if that means killing somebody, that angry God is angry at. <laughs> to keep that same angry God from being angry at you, we'll kill people in the name of that God, to please or appease that God. Most of the wars that have been fought in human history have been fought, you can trace their anguish back to some religious ideology. These hundred girls, young or teenage girls that have been stolen and are into sex slaves and made sex slaves um, of some abstract, abstract part of, of, of Islam in Nigeria. It's built around religion. They don't want them westernized. They're covering them from head to toe uh, so that they won't look, they won't show their bodies. They're beautiful God-created bodies. But that particular aspect of Islam, uh, and which is some aspects of Christianity, when the women have to be so clothed and covered up and they, they can't be beautiful or sensual or sexual or attractive. And it's horrible what women go through in those cultures, all in the name of some God. They stone them. That's a biblical term. They beat them. They kill them. Men experience it too, but not near at the rate or with the violence. Remember the, the young uh, Islamic girl that was shot because she was getting education. Women aren't supposed to learn. They're not supposed to have education. So the, the um, Taliban, which is an extreme fundamentalist Muslim sect, extreme fundamentalism in any religion is a threat to human society. It is, it is more than a nuclear bomb because they're the quick ones to drop one on you. Extreme hyper-fundamentalism in any religion tends to be militant and angry and visceral and they don't mind killing and cutting and cursing for what they believe in. And so I address it because we need to to alleviate. Here's a chance. We have a window of opportunity to see that dissipate with the next generations. we got to stop it because it's destroying the planet. Just like global warming and I call it the correction of the universe. It's cleansing and clearing and and correcting itself. I have a friend that has a product called Resolve where it's, it's an environmentally safe green product that cleans windows and surfaces and detergents and they're creating more. Uh, and big companies like Walmart and, and uh, uh, Disney are buying it out because it's, and it's so successful. We're all astounded of how successful this product is. And we would, I discussed with him several times that this is a part of the cleansing and purification of the culture of all the toxins and the contaminants that we have put into it, the toxicity, the poison of religion. What I'm doing, things like what I think maybe Oprah is doing and so, so, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Soful Sunday thing is powerful. This new way of thinking, this expanded consciousness, this new thought, uh, and this now thought that a generation's coming on that just doesn't buy into all this stuff. Now we're considered the apostasy, the falling away. Paul is trying to correct the, uh, the anxiety that he created in the first letter to the church of Thessalonica, talking about the second coming. And now he comes back in the second uh, letter and he tones it down a little bit by saying the coming of the Lord in the, um, uh, let me see how the exact, the exact scripture, 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. It's concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had talked about in the first letter, and our being gathered to him, which Paul thought was going to happen in his lifetime. He and the early apostles were so panicked by the terrible persecution they were receiving, they were surely thinking the Lord would come. So the questions came to him after the first letter, what about the Christians that are being killed? Because many of them were being killed. How will they benefit from the second coming of the Lord? What will they be rescued from? They're being killed now and persecuted now. Jesus is not has not come back and how many more will die or be persecuted before he comes back and what will happen to them when he comes back. So Paul's, who's come up with this whole second coming concept, it's his, it's an original with Paul. Um, Though other religions taught that their 
God person in all the way back to thousands of years before Christianity and uh, it predates Judaism, the concept of Judaism and messia messianic returns. This whole second coming mentality is old and it's all based on some teacher or miracle worker or messianic type personality or God person from Dionysius in Greek, Greek uh, mythology to Osiris or Isis in Egyptian uh, theology and, and mythology and history. Uh, the Book of the Dead, all these things, if you go back in history, you'll find there's always been some God person or God man, rarely a woman, uh, because of the chauvinism of the whole mentality about gender references to God as being a male or a father or whatever. Um, there's a lot out there that frustrates a lot of people. But this fear of a, and this desire of a second coming has always been there. It's not, it didn't start with Christianity. It may not end with it. So he says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by a letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. People were thinking that Christ had come and taken away the good ones and the rest of them were going to suffer. So Paul said, I don't care what they're prophesying or some letter that somebody forged in my name. I didn't write it. The second coming hasn't come. Verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness, or there was some translations say sin, is revealed. The, the, the day of rebellion, the falling away, uh, that is called the apostasy. People are considering me a part of the great falling away. Bishop Pearson has fallen away, and he's leading millions from Jesus or into hell or all this kind of stuff. That's all based on these scriptures. The great falling away and the great antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction or the son of perdition. That's a superstitious fear and anticipation of a quote-unquote antichrist. The con that concept has produced incredible paranoia within Christendom for millennia. For thousands of years, people have been afraid of the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist is a Christian concept based on interpretation of passages in the New Testament, First and Second John. In traditional Christian belief, get this, Jesus the Messiah appears in his second coming on earth to face the emergence of this Antichrist figure, this nemesis, this horrendous person. Um, just as Christ is the Savior, uh, and the ideal model for humanity in Christian concepts. His opponent uh, in the end days, the last days, will be a single figure of concentrated evil. Now, some people thought that was Hitler. Some people think it was the Pope. In the day of the reform, the, church, the reformation of the church, Martin Luther, they thought it was the papacy or the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church by some people is considered the apostate church the church that fell away from the original teachings of the gospel of the first century Christians that was created by Constantine and Nicaea and the Nicene Creed and, and the Holy Roman Catholic Church or the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic is the Latin word for universal. The universal church, it's a cult following of Jesus. That's what it's become. That's the apostate church. We've added all these other critical lit lit uh, liturgies and doctrines and dogmas and tyrannies that controlled the masses of people, which was the, the objective of Constantine, the Roman emperor, who merged Christianity into the Roman religion. They already worshipped on Sunday because they were sun worshippers, so Sunday, and then of course Monday is moon day, or moon day, Monday. Uh, Venus, the sex goddess, and venereal bishops, and uh, venerable bishops, and venereal diseases. Sex was a part of the religion. Christianity is a fertility religion. I, I've taught about so much of that in the past, so I don't want to get too far in it tonight because I want to make these other points. Now, belief in this abstract concept that has become a kind of mental illness, a paranoia, the second coming, and, and uh, uh, the Antichrist, and the end time false prophet and the falling away. Many millions of fundamentalist Christians are paranoid and tormented by that day and night. They're praying and fasting as I once did, afraid of the second coming. You know, the whole concept of he's making a list and checking it twice and going to find out who's naughty or nice. Jesus Christ is coming, or Santa Claus is one of them is coming to town. You better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout up telling you why. Who's coming to town? The second coming. We want it and we're afraid of it. We're afraid of getting caught with our work undone. That we might not. We might, I used to be afraid of being caught in a theater or at a sports game, and I never went to athletic games for that reason. Coming up, we, we preached that was the seat of the scornful. 
the the craziness of this fear-based theology has created a kind of mental illness that has affected millions in epidemic, pandemic ways. Paranoia, para means irregular, naus is the Greek word for mind. Irregular thinking, a mental condition that's characterized by delusions of persecution. That's what paranoia is. It, it has this, 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 th- these delusions of unwarranted jealousy or exaggerated self-importance, typically elaborated into, these, into an organized system of thought. It may be an aspect of chronic personality disorder, some dictionaries define it that way, of drug abuse, of a serious condition such as schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, in which the person loses touch with reality. How many Christians, or Muslims even, some Jews, specifically the, the strict Orthodox Hasidic Jews, they really lost touch with reality. Does not that sound like a, a lot of religion, including Christianity, This they, they lose touch with reality? This paranoia, this schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a long-term mental disorder of a type involving a breakdown in uh, the relationship between thought, emotion, behavior, leading to, to, to uh, faulty perceptions. Schizophrenia, inappropriate actions, feelings, people withdraw from reality and personal relationships into fantasies and delusions and a sense of mental fragmentation. Schizophrenia, I've met, I, I grew up with people like that. I wouldn't have used the term, for instance, schizophrenia or paranoia. I knew not, neither of them meant. I never heard those terms uh, used in the community in which I was raised. But I saw that this crazy long-term mental... We used to actually say, these folks are crazy. Some of the things we did in church uh, and around religion my parents included and their parents included we did and a lot of that craziness is still going on today in many religions you know when you get these really pious people that are burning candles and and crawling around and wearing certain garments and looking all withdrawn and pious and afraid of the God and I'm not denouncing all of it because I don't know that it'll ever go away people are just fear God and love God. I was one of them. I fasted and prayed and I still fast and pray. I still speak in tongues. I still do a lot of the things my Pentecostal roots taught me to do habitually and um, it somehow it addresses some issue in my, my mentality. I do it privately, but I do it powerfully and because I believe in the results, I get them. Same with somebody that's meditating all the time or well, I met a lady the other day that had a stroke and what she did for a month, she dug a hole and, 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 and covered herself with dirt from the dust we came to the dust we returned. She, it's like hugging a tree and letting the, the, the energy of the earth heal her. She never went to the hospital or doctor. She was paralyzed on part of her body. But her belief system said if you dig a hole and get in the dirt and cover yourself up with dirt, you'll be healed. And she was. There's a place in the scripture where Jesus spat on the, the uh, with a blind man, spat in the dirt, made clay of the spittle, and put it on the blind man's eyes and told him to go watch. That's in the New Testament. Jesus did it. And the guy came back seen. These are what we call acts of faith. All these people on television that give you green claws or holy water, Catholic holy water. We, we have all these icons, whether that's rosary beads or crucifixes or certain colors of garment. Um, uh, wearing white or, you know, the Pope in all of the vestments of the papacy or the priesthood or the bishopric of the episcopacy. I have those garments. I've been through all that. I know what anointed oil is. I know what anointed water is. I know what prayer cloths are. Uh, I know what, what laying on of hands is. I've seen results because that's the way I believed. And I'm not denouncing all of that, though it may be excessive and extreme in some people's mentality. As long as it's not hurting people, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm cool with it. It's when we fear God to the point that we assume that he is angry or it is angry with us and somebody else who doesn't believe like us or who's disobedient, which scripture refers to the disobedient, uh, gays or Catholics or Jews or agnostics or uh, atheists or Methodist or Baptist or whatever, Buddhist, Hindus, Muslims. We have all these fragmentations and judgments on people who are not like us. And uh, we don't see them as children of God. We see them as enemies of God. And that God would kill them and torture them and torment them. That was the basis of what Hitler believed. That when he burned all the Jews, they were the Jesus killers. So he felt justified through scripture. He called himself a Christian. If you read my book, the gospel, um, the book titled God is Not a Christian, I have documentation of some of the things that Hitler believed about Jesus. 
He called himself a Christian, a born-again Christian, that Jesus was his Lord. And he was doing these things in honor of Christ and had duplicity with the Catholic Church who cooperated with him. Because Christian, Christians have for years had this slight mentality, even though Jesus was a Jew in the early writers of the scriptures. The Bible is a Jewish book written to Jews by Jews about a Jewish concept of God. And then Christianity is a form uh, of Judaism, abstract, of course. Indirectly, various aspects of Islam is Semitic. The people, the culture in the Middle East is Semitic. We can resolve these issues, but we've got to be willing to confront them and not combat them. Just look at what we're believing and why we're believing it. Pat Robertson, look how extreme. This happened in September um, 2013, but that's not even been a year ago. Um, Televangelist and 700 Club host Pat Robertson, who's 83 today, interrupted a segment of his show, this was last September, dedicated to fielding audience questions to describe the method by which he has remained straight and AIDS-free. Now, he seems to indicate that he could be gay or go gay or turn gay and get AIDS. Right there, that, that comment right there says that he has the vulnerability and the propensity to become gay. Now, watch this. He describes the method by which he has remained straight and AIDS-free throughout his long preaching career. Robertson, whose show reaches nearly a million people still to this day, uh, a million viewers a day, said that since 1969, he's been wearing an anti-sodomite necklace, which, according to Robertson, repels homosexuals and other queers and keeps him free from their abhorrent lifestyles and gay diseases. Now, this is Pat Robertson, 83 years. I know him personally. I've co-hosted his program. I've been a guest for him on the program. It is at one time, at one time was considered uh, succeeding... Um, um, ben Kinslow, who was his co-host for many years when Pat ran for president, they, I was flown in. I was investigated and interviewed, almost interrogated about being his assistant. So he came and preached at ORU. We gave our law school to Regents University. Paul has, he didn't have the, as many followers today, Pat, as he had years ago when he owned the whole CBN network, which he sold. He now just has the 700 Club program. But he still has a, viewer, a million viewers a day. When all the gayness, he's I'm quoting him, when all the gayness poisoning our, with all the gayness poisoning our great nation these days, you might think it's only by God's grace that I have managed to remain straight and healthy through it all, Pat Robertson told his viewers. What is he? Is he suggesting that you can catch gayness like a disease? <laughs> that it's contagious? But, he says, for once, this was no miracle. I have only my gay repelling necklace to thank. Not God. I have only my gay repelling necklace to thank. Now, he said this as recent as September 19, uh, 2013, which has kept all sexual degenerates at least 20 feet away from me for the last 44 years. Ever since the Stonewall riots convinced me, he says, that gays were coming for my heterosexuality. They were coming for my... He felt he could lose his heterosexuality. So he's paranoid. Talk about homophobia. He's not afraid of gays. He's afraid of his own gayness that he could possibly... He's admitting it right here on nationwide television. <laughs> this is a quote. Look it up. Just Google Pat Robertson and the gay necklace or whatever. Robertson neglected to fully explain the necklace's powers, revealing only that it involves hyper-masculine materials such as moose semen and barbed wire. Dear God. But said that he is, uh, but but said that he is finally ready to share it with the world. He's kept this secret to himself. This has kept Pat Robertson, who's three years old, in his forties. Evidently, he had some inclinations toward gayness. It's a married man with kids. For only ten easy payments of fifty nine ninety nine, you can protect yourself from fancy boy disease spreading homosexuals. Robertson said. 700 Club producers expect sales of the necklace to generate substantial funds for the show, which netted over 400 million in donations in 2005 alone. That's how popular this program was when he was going after the progressives and the liberals and, you know, his and the Limbaugh's and all these um, uh, super fundamentalist right wing advocates. Robertson's unveiling came as a response to inquiries, inquiries concerning comments he made on his show earlier this week that week in, in, in uh, 
September 13th. On Tuesday of that week, Robertson used a portion, a portion of his show, to claim that American homosexuals in cities like San Francisco are intentionally spreading AIDS via special rings that cut your finger during handshakes and thereby by infect you with the deadly HIV virus. Really, the host said. And this host adopted a baby from us. Um, when I had my, my, my uh, home friend with mothers in my adoption agency in Tulsa. I've been connected with that ministry a long time, a lot of Christian fundamentalism, but I've, I've awakened. I'm a considerate apostate because I've extended my consciousness and I have fallen away. Now, I've stepped away from that insanity. It's that kind of vicious stuff which would be the equivalent of murder, Pat Robertson says, about this ring that gays wear. Lots of people wrote in to ask how they can protect themselves from these queer ring-toting murderers, Robertson said Thursday on that program in 2013, September. Well, that made me realize I had to come clean about my anti-gay necklace, Paul, uh, Pat Robertson says. It's time for the world to know. I have an anti-gay ne-. And people start writing in by the thousands to get that necklace to protect them not from other gays, but from their gayness. All these people fear they can catch gayness or homosexuality like it's a cold, a flu virus. <laughs> not just HIV. They're scared to catch it gay. <laughs> you're going to catch gay. It's like, come on, you're going to catch the flu. You'll catch your death of cold. You better get away from those gays. You're going to catch a gay. Catch gayness. <laughs> Talk about falling away from original principles that, principles that Jesus taught. The church, that kind of fundamentalism, and Paul, Pat, bless his heart. He's 83, but he still does it, and he says some really crazy stuff, and then he apologizes for it, and then he says something else, and he apologizes, and he still has over a million viewers. I, that's insanity. That's paranoia. That's schizophrenia. Now, the term apostasy is used by sociologists to mean renunciation and criticism of or opposition to a person's former religion in a technical sense and without expressing contempt or disapproval. Now, I'm sort of an apostate in that sense. As I looked at what I believed and I realized just with common sense that I was in error and that I think we've been sold a, a bill of goods. That doesn't change my love for the teachings of Jesus or the image that we project of him or of many aspects of the scriptures, which makes sense some, but I don't consider it this inspired, holy, unadulterated, infallible, inerrant word of God. I believe it's the errant, fallible, inspired word of man or men about God. I don't hear perfect sermons. But just like inspired books or inspired music or, or poems like, like um, our beloved uh, Maya Angelou, who just made her transition this week, her, her stuff was so inspired and she inspired the world and things that were written by Nelson Mandela or, or uh, Marianne Williamson or Deepak Chopra or Wayne Dyer or T.D. Jakes or Oprah Winfrey um, or Joel Goldstein. Charles Fillmore, you know, Ernest Holmes, Eric Butterworth. I mean, I read so much powerful stuff. I, I love to read. I'm an avid reader. I spend hours and hours reading and studying and praying and saying and listening and meditating and going through whatever little ritual I have. Um, so some call me an apostate. Yes, I admit that I, I, I'm stepping away from some of that stuff and I'm encouraging others who have these questions to reconsider what you believe and why you believe it. Because I think those belief systems again, particularly of the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have caused a lot of derision and brokenness and violence on this planet. Many religious groups in some states punish apostates. Apostates may be shunned by the members of their own religious group. That could be Scientology or, or Mormonism or Christian science or religious science or Pentecostalism. Apostates can be shunned by the members of their, their, their former group or subjected to formal or informal punishment. They didn't punish me, but they excommunicated me and they labeled me a heretic. This may be the official policy of the religious group or may simply be the voluntary action of its members. Stay away from Carlson Pearson. He's of the devil. Stay away from 
T.D. Jakes or stay away from Oprah Winfrey or stay away from some pope or some 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 died in the wool old fashioned Catholics don't like the new pope because he said atheists could go to heaven and don't judge gays and some come up, come down out of those come off those high um, pedestals and get down to where the people are the hurting people. Some Catholics don't like him for that reason. Some priests don't like him for that reason. Um, some some particular disciplines excommunicate the apostate, and then while some religious scriptures demand the death penalty for apostates, kill them, stone them, put them outside the camp. Again, none so deaf as those who will not hear, none so blind as those who will not see, quoting Matthew Henry. The information highway, superhighway, was designed, I posted this today, the information superhighway was designed to link everyone at home or office to everything else, movies, television shows, shopping channels, services, electronic mail, and huge collections of data or data never before so easily and readily available and accessible to unlimited numbers of people across this planet. You don't have to have a library card to check out a book. You can just Google stuff. Now, you can't take everything on there as being absolutely accurate or precise, but in general, when it comes to the data uh, and, and information that confirms truths and realities scientifically and intellectually and scholastically and historically, there's enough true stuff out there that you can learn. In in, in, in 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 such a day like today, when it, when information is so available, ignorance is a choice. It's as much a choice as it is a liability. You don't have to have a degree to know. You don't have to have a formal college education. You don't have to go to seminary to be able to seminary the insemination of truths or concepts. That's what the word seminary comes from. Um, you don't have to go to a seminary to get an education about the Bible. You can study the internet. Look up the word devil, the history of devils. There are books on it. Where we get the concept of hell. Study its original terminologies. The word Gehenna in, in Hebrew. Gay meaning gully or gorge. Valley of Hinnom. And what it meant in Jesus' day and when he referred to it. Get past Dante's Inferno and go to the original meaning of those terms. Uh, the history of devils. They go way beyond... Christianity, aspects of Greek mythology, Judaism, all the way back to Egyptian Book of the Dead, and believe in life, belief in life after this one, and scary stuff. <laughs> it's all in there. Just read, study, and then make your own assessments. But the criminalization of people based on doctrines in scripture or dogmas and in religions uh, makes us kill each other or fear each other. And judge each other. So I'm, I'm a peace agent. I'm trying to say, let's reconsider all of this. But I have to keep going back to the theology or the God logic because God is so powerful in people's thinking. They worship these gods. And these gods determine how they respond to life and to those who are living, even in their own families. People have been beheaded, disemboweled, dismembered, tortured and burnt around beliefs and gods. And it's been done in the names of these gods who are basically embellished demons that we've used to, to hurt people. You don't need a college education or degree to be informed and an informed person, but there is a difference between reading and studying. And that includes the Bible, which is referred to by me as the Word of God. Reading, translating, and interpreting the Bible is no small discipline. How you read it, how you interpret it, how you translate it, and it's done so that's why you have so many different denominations because it's read differently uh, and believed differently and translated and interpreted differently. Modern information demands we reconsider what we believe and why we believe it. Even about the Bible, one of the most important and impacting books in human history, particularly in the Western world. The more you study it, the Bible, it's history and it's historicity, which means it's authenticity. It's authors and authenticity. It's, it's, it's authorship. The more you realize that it's not all we've been told or taught it is. The Bible I'm talking about. And I, I, all this will be in a book someday for you. 
And that over the millennia, over the thousands of years, we have made the Bible a god with a little g, an idol. And we've often used that idol to justify, support, sponsor some of the most vile, destructive vice and violence in human history. And we do it in the name of God or sometimes in the name of Jesus. Can you imagine the Muslims saying, Allah Akbar, God is great? Allah Akbar. Asking God to, to, to bless their militant actions while Christians have their guns and are praying in the name of Jesus that the bullet makes its target or the bomb makes its target or the missile hits its target. Grown men with guns and war uh, clothes on uniforms, you know, hoods and things, shooting bombs. It comes on television so often, you see it. That's human beings. That's the most barbaric action, reaction, or response in the human culture. We drop bombs on each other. And if we glorify war, Christianity, the cathedrals of Europe, I went to Canterbury. One, the thing I remember most about the, the, uh, the Canterbury Cathedral is that the walls and floors are all graves for soldiers that that's the Anglican church headquarters of Canterbury, England we did a television special over there with Little Roberts back in 1972 and I was I was paranoid because I was standing on somebody's grave Westminster Abbey in, in London, all the cathedrals in Europe <coughs> are, are monuments to dead soldiers and a dead Jesus who was resurrected and the cross or crucifix, the cross, the cruz aid, cruz is the Latin word for cross, the cruz aid, the crosses on the shields and the bucklers and the, the armor of the soldiers and, and, and uh, uh, um, um, fighting for Christ, onward Christian soldiers fighting for the right. Um, it, there's a militancy about it. It's inextricably connected to war. And fighting. And then, you know, the scripture says Jesus is going to come back on a horse with a sword and fight the devil. That's in our Bibles. This whole militancy of fighting to make it in, fighting demons and fighting the devil and fighting the Muslims and fighting the Christians and fighting the Jews and fighting the, the, the agnostics and, and fighting Carlton Pearson. There's so many people that that uh, are fighting. The Christian television stations don't want to mention my name or my Azusa product, that, which I'm uh, you know, re-releasing. Re um, there's this fear out there. And I, look, I understand it because I once lived there. I don't buy into it. I think it's totally absurd and obscene. But it's present. So I'm addressing it. If I was saying this on nationwide television, it would upset a lot of people, but it would also free a lot of people. Okay, I can't go on nationwide television right now. I'm not there. So I'm doing it in cyber. I'm going to build a worldwide church without walls right here on cyber. And I'm going to South Africa next month, my wife and I and my family. Her, her women's empowerment luncheon of 2,500 is already sold out. And we're still almost three weeks away. I have 3,000 that are coming to hear me speak on leadership already sold out. They want me to bring the book, The Gospel of Inclusion, and God is Not a Christian, and talk about these things on nationwide television. The same lady who interviewed uh, Oprah is like the Oprah of South Africa is going to interview Gina and I. And we're going to talk about it because South Africa is ready for a shift, as many other places on the planet. I got a letter that I need to answer now from some one of my spiritual sons, whom I've never met except through the internet. D.E. Ponk has met him. He lives in Prague, Czechoslovakia. A city that's 97% atheist. He's from rich root, Pentecostal roots. Still speaks in tongues. But he, he's shifted in his consciousness. Still has his devotion to God. But he's, he's reframing it to where the... And, and getting away from religion into spirituality. Deepak Chopra was there last week. And as my friend spoke to him, Deepak sent his regards to me as I sent mine to him. Uh, and they love, he packed out the auditorium of the venue. They love Deepak Chopra in that atheist country. <laughs> and Deepak has had to debate with atheists about his belief in God. But his approach is different. It's more mystical and spiritual than religious. Prague is, is known as, this, I think it's called the city of a thousand steeples. 
or something like that. Because you look across the, that beautiful city, I'm going to go there next year, you see all these, these ornate, artistic, beautiful steeples with crosses on them. And 90% of the population of the country is atheist. And yet you got church steeples that have more pigeons than peoples. <laughs> Nobody's going to those churches. That's how religion, what you've seen in Europe, you will ultimately see in America. And I know that alarms all the fundamentalists. But the church, including the Christian church, as you see it today, will not exist as it does today 50 years from now. Possibly not 25. With four to 7,000 churches closing every year, 15, 12 to 1,500 pastors leaving the ministry every month, about that many laity leaving the church every day, they're experiencing and experimenting with other ways of thinking. How can we re remain relevant and relate faith to culture without making the shift? What worked 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago is not working the same way today. This is a new age. Accept it. Don't be threatened by it. I'm not threatened by it. My faith in God has expanded. My experience of God has expanded, and it can for you too. I've read, studied, and cherished the scriptures all my life and have experienced great growth and revelation concerning the values and virtues of critical thinking around the scriptures. You're not diminished by accepting the fact that we may have gotten a lot of our theologies or our God logic wrong and in some cases have actually been sold a bill of goods. Such a realization can't and doesn't diminish any infinite reality we call God because if in fact God is all some believe him or her or it to be, then he, she, or it, they can't be diminished anyway. Finite minds or mentalities cannot demean or diminish infinite realities or truths. So why all the panic, whether Jewish, Christian, or Muslim? Chill. If your God is as powerful and infinite and, and omnipotent and omnipresent, present everywhere, and omniscient, all signs, all knowing, then what do you, how can, you can't hurt God. You can't even offend God. You can't make God angry. That's the way man has portrayed it in scripture. But you need to review and revise what you think about scripture. Read it. We say read it to, see, uh, read it to be wise, believe it to be saved, practice it to be holy, know it in your head, store it in your heart, show it in your life. I, my mother made me memorize that when I was a little kid about the Bible. And I've done all that. And I still do some of it. <laughs> but I don't take it literally. Apostasy is considered the abandonment or renunciation of religious or political belief. I'm an apostate. It is the desertion of one's culture or cause in favor of an opposing or perhaps not necessarily opposing, just a different one. It doesn't have to mean you're wrong to be an apostate. Just not the same as another position or another posture. Millions of people, especially within the Abrahamic faith of Judaism and Christianity, are reconsidering the virtue and validity of what they've been told or taught for centuries. That's all right. We, we need to reconsider this stuff. We've gotten ourselves in some serious trouble believing crazy things. And so we need to re accept the shock there's an awakening going on. There's a, there's a brand new, there's a fresh turn on, a fresh ideology about a lot of things that's very powerful. And um, I want you to reconsider, you know, some of the stuff you believe. Will you do that? Will you join me in Israel in 2015 when we're going to go there and meet with Jews and Muslims and Druids and go up to Haifa? It's on the site here, bishopherson.com. And to start registering now, you need five hundred dollars to to register, but then you can pay the rest of it. I'll be two, three thousand before you finish. But you've got well over a year to do it. Let's go over there. We've been bringing gays with us the first time. Same gender loving people will actually come because there's a huge preponderance of same gender loving people within Israel, and they're believers. Many of them are Jews, brought up in the Jewish synagogues, and they're gay, but they love God in their way. And there's many who are going to come with us from the United States. We're going to meet and have panel discussions with Jews, Muslims, um, uh, Christians. We're going to baptize people in the River Jordan who want to. Different ritualist 
ritualistic cleansing, if that's what people want. We'll uh, stick our feet and walk along the Mediterranean. We'll go to the empty tomb. We'll go to the garden tomb. We'll go to a lot of the holy spots. We'll go to Mount Zion and we'll look at the, uh, we'll go to the Western Wall or some people call it the Wailing Wall. And we'll travel and study history, but we will have very provocative uh, conversations and discussions and panel interactions and music. I'm not intimidated by any of that or any of them. Will you go with me? And will you support what I'm doing? We want to build a worldwide church without walls that will be very inclusive. I have lots of friends, people from the Unification Church and uh, Sun Young Moon. I speak for them. I'm going to be speaking in a couple of weeks for the for the American clergy uh, seminar right here in Chicago. I've spoken probably two or three times already. Um, a lot of preachers are involved, Pentecostals, Baptists. This is a great day. Some wonderful things are happening, and you can be a part of it. So push the donate button. I need some real partners, people that will really stand with me in this new way of thinking and being and creating. My wife and I plan to move back to Tulsa, but keep an office here in Chicago, and um, to be near my aging parents and ailing parents. And uh, we'll keep the office here, and we'll come back to Chicago regularly, at least once a month to speak, unless I'm invited otherwise. But uh, my son will stay here, and we're going to do some interesting things and build. But I need uh, a whole bunch of you to really stand with me and support financially. $10 a week or a month or $20. Some people commit $150 a month. Um, some of you can make a one-time gift of 1000 or 500 You like what I'm saying. You're business people. Um, you, you're looking. You, nobody ever knows that you're watching this or that you're reading this or you're cons- considering what I'm saying. So you're free to, to do whatever you want to. You know, nobody, you could be Nicodemus and come to me by night. It's cost me a lot to do this. And I'm going back to where, to the scene of the crime, <laughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma. Some of you may have heard that Robert Redford has signed on to, is in deep, serious conversation about playing Oral Roberts in a movie based on This American Life, the interview that I gave with National Public Radio. I've been texting Jeffrey Wright. He's in Berlin taping for uh, the end games the second one and uh, he's been considered to play me and so I've met with him we're friends now uh, there are other people that I'm not at liberty to name right now who are being considered to play in the role but they're huge names the, the play in the movie and um, it's nothing mean spirited about it but it does ex- it does trace my experience it's embellished of course in some ways as always is the case you can't take 61 years of living and put it in 90 minutes without you know tweaking some stuff but for the most part it's pretty accurate I've read the script uh, and talked with the writer who happens to be an atheist Marcus Enchi <laughs> one of my best friends he's an atheist in this I'm an atheist who is a theist see I believe in God but just not the one I was taught that one's mean and, and crazy and abstract it's a monster I don't believe in that God anymore I believe in the God of my own experience the God of my own understanding and God of my own expression. Can you handle that? <laughs> I know it's a little, a little creepy, a little scary, but you, you'll get through with it. So reconsider um, these kinds of things and, and uh, uh, get a hold of a new way of being. I love you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your treasure. Thank you for your consciousness for helping us do what we do. God bless you. God be you. Good night. I said God with a little G. Good night.